having spent the past decade attempting to prove one of the most unpopular postulates in modern times, one glaring shortcoming with science and the scientific method has become apparent. The meaning of the words evidence and proof and the acceptance of the latter are hopelessly subjective and open to interpretation. For example, Merriam-Webster defines evidence as an outward sign or indication that furnishes proof, and then defines proof as the cogency of evidence that compels acceptance by the mind of a truth or a fact. In other words, evidence is something that furnishes proof, and proof is whenever someone accepts a preponderance of evidence as actually being the truth. The problem with this is that when truth runs counter to people's long-standing preconceptions, beliefs, and biases, no matter how much or how conclusive the evidence presented, they can, and very often will, refuse to accept it as proof. In 1885, William Carpenter published his book, 100 Proofs That the Earth is Not a Globe, which inspired me 130 years later to write and publish my book, 200 Proofs Earth is Not a Spinning Ball. Upon the release of Carpenter's book, many readers were swayed by the evidence provided and agreed that his arguments furnished absolute proof that Earth could not possibly be a globe. Likewise, since the release of my own, many people have reached the same conclusion, and agree that based on the preponderance of evidence provided, there is absolutely no way the stationary, level Earth beneath our feet could actually be a tilting, wobbling, spinning oblate spheroid. The vast majority, however, indoctrinated by heliocentric pseudoscience and blinded by generational brainwashing, could be shown 10,000 proofs Earth is not a spinning ball, and due to cognitive dissonance, Dunning-Kruger effect, and other psychological barriers, still be unable to accept the new information. By comparison, doing a Google search for globe Earth proofs, the most I could find gathered in one place is only 10. So quantitatively, Mine and Carpenter's books are furnishing 10 to 20 times more proof in our pudding than the globe has available anywhere. Not to mention, all 10 of the supposed globe proofs offered, such as circumnavigation, ships disappearing over the horizon, and Foucault's pendulums, are thoroughly debunked within my 200 proofs book. But what about qualitatively? Most agree quality is more important than quantity anyway. So are the few globe proofs offered better reasoned and more conclusive than the alternative? Herein lies the rub. The answer to this question is completely subjective and open to the interpretation of each individual. One person will read both the popular science article, Ten Ways You Can Tell the Earth is Round, and my book, Two Hundred Proofs Earth is Not a Spinning Ball, then claim the evidence provided in the latter was far more voracious and conclusive than the former. Meanwhile, another person will also read both, and they will form the exact opposite conclusion. Science and the scientific method present themselves as the gold standard for arriving at objective truth, but the inherent subjectivity of the scientists and the psychological biases of others interpreting the evidence is a wild card so variable as to render most results inconclusive. Hence, there are almost always scientists on both sides of diametrically opposed mutually exclusive issues who both believe they have proof for their claims. In reality, only one of them can be correct, but both believe they have logic, reason, and demonstrable results on their side. For example, whenever two non-uniform pressure systems are not separated by a solid physical barrier, they will always quickly equilibrate. When you puncture a hole in a spray canister, the aerosol swiftly sprays out until the pressure inside and outside the can are equal. When you open the door to a vacuum chamber, the artificial vacuum created inside instantly disappears and evens out. This is a provable, repeatable, demonstrable scientific fact of reality, and hundreds or thousands of experiments would reveal the same results. Every time a higher and lower pressure system are not separated from one another by a solid membrane or physical container of some sort, the higher pressure system will rush into the space of the lower until they equilibrate. Scientists will nod their heads in unanimous agreement about this obvious proven fact until you present them with one further example. Earth's atmosphere and the infinite vacuum of outer space. In the heliocentric model, the Earth globe, along with all the other ball planets in the ever-expanding universe, 
have their own unique atmospheres separated only by the vacuum of space. There is no solid barrier or physical container between the atmospheres of the Earth and the other planets and the outer space vacuum that surrounds them. Astronauts claim to leave our atmosphere gradually, and then, after reaching an imaginary area approximately 62 miles high called the Kármán Line, they say they have now left the atmosphere and are officially in outer space. So unlike every experiment ever devised, which shows two pressure systems must be separated by a solid barrier or else quickly equilibrate, special exception is made for Earth and space. Somehow, Earth's atmosphere just magically maintains its pressure until gradually becoming the vacuum of outer space. Currently, less than 600 people in history have claimed to have left Earth's atmosphere, and as shown in my book, The Flat Earth Conspiracy, most of them are admitted Freemasons, oath-bound members of the largest and oldest secret society in the world. The reality is that most scientists and lay people alike believe the lies and camera tricks of these men over proven, demonstrable, repeatable science. No heliocentric scientist can provide a demonstration of a positive pressure system existing adjacent to a negative pressure system without a solid separation between them, but yet they will throw away the entire scientific method in favor of the testimony of astronauts. This is just one example, and there are hundreds more, where the subjective limitations of science and the scientific method are made apparent. No matter how much evidence is provided in favor of a proposition, and no matter how little evidence provided against it, many people can and will still refuse to relent. There is no objective standard for what constitutes proof. It is open to the interpretation of each individual exactly when a preponderance of evidence has crossed the imaginary line between theory and truth. This, more than any other reason, is why the globe earth theory is still believed by the majority. They have already accepted a plethora of pseudoscientific hypotheses as being proven beyond reproach, so no number of demonstrations or debates will sway them from their chosen conclusion.